Good morning, everybody. It's such a tremendous pleasure uh, to be here, and I want to add my uh, welcome to you, uh, our, our friends who are visiting from out of town. And I want to focus on really what I see as the opportunities and challenges in enabling uh, precision health on a global scale. So we just heard about the Precision Medicine Initiative and the bold uh, launch that uh, we as a, a country have taken to integrate electronic health record data and genomics across millions of participants. And uh, one of the, the big challenges that we're going to face as we uh, undertake this activity, a multi-year activity, is how we interpret this information and provide it back to participants. And of course, part of the goal of this work is to both discover new things and then translate that um, into improved healthcare. One big gaping head wound is that the vast majority of studies to date have only focused on populations of European descent. And so we really run the risk of developing um, a technology that's going to broaden health disparities. And, and this keeps me up at night. And, and I know it also keeps, uh, among other things, the president up at night. And that's why diversity was actually included as one of the planks of, of the Precision Medicine Initiative. And we and others have argued that it's incredibly important to include diverse populations in genomics research, both for ethical reasons, uh, but also for largely scientific reasons, that different populations may likely have different alleles that predispose them to the same you know, coarse set of phenotypes that uh, on, on the surface look to be the same, but in fact, genetically may have very different uh, underlying etiologies. And so I, I want to update you today on, on this work, and in particular, some of the uh, reagents that we've helped the National Institutes of Health develop that we hope will really sort of move the needle in, in this regard. Um, I'll begin with the sort of questions that, that I'm most passionate about. And these include, you know, why do we need to do uh, diverse um, studies? What, what is the purpose? What is the scientific value of including diversity uh, in, in the precision medicine initiative? Secondly, once we've identified a set of genes that we believe to be clinically relevant, and, and part of our work as, as part of the uh, ClinGen, the Clinical Genome Resource, really focuses on this, how do we systematically identify the population risk alleles and really sort of roll this out in, in terms of public health measures? So we can think about BRCA1 and 2 testing, for example, and the fact that if you're a European woman, the variants of unknown significant that, um, that you see uh, on a whole are far lower than if you were a woman of a Indian Asian descent, right? So how do we you know, sort of remedy this situation? And then lastly, how do we go the last mile? How do we really integrate this into clinical decision support so that it doesn't just stay in the ivory tower, but actually translates not only into academic medical centers like Stanford, but really into community hospitals like Miami Children's Hospital, for example, where some of us were last week talking to them about this kind of work. And I'll give you one example of why this may be important. Um, this is uh, an association between a, uh, an allele in the, our HLA system, the B5701 allele, and hypersensitivity to the most commonly prescribed HIV uh, medicine as part of the triple cocktail. So if you happen to have this version of, of HLA and you're given a Bacavir, the first time you're going to get really, really sick. Okay, you're going to have a host of terrible symptoms. You're going to be, you know, really put at, at risk. And of course, these are patients that are already immunocompromised. And what's worst is the second time you were to get this, you might die. Okay, now there's really no debate in the literature about whether or not you should prescribe a back of ear to someone that's got this HLA type, right? It's really a sort of no go, go decision. And what's interesting from a population genetics point of view is that the frequency of this haplotype varies dramatically across populations. And from publicly available data, the most common, you know, the population where this is seen most frequently are the Gujarati in India, for at least for the data that, that's been out there. The second most common are the Maasai in Kenya. Okay. And I can tell you as a professional population geneticist, there's no model out there that would tell you, if you see something at high frequency in the Gujarati, obviously the next group to look at are the Maasai in Kenya. Right? There's an empirical question. We really need to create a resource that allows us to blanket the communities and, and really on the ground get data on the frequency of these clinically relevant variants. So as, um, uh, the, the other part of this is that 
Um, if, if we're able to create such a reagent, we could actually enable a next generation of large-scale genome-wide association studies in diverse populations. And I'm going to make the argument that there's still plenty of low-hanging fruit uh, that we can gather in, in this kind of work, because 96% of the participants that have been enrolled in studies so far are individuals of European descent. Right? So if we broaden representation, we're very likely to find new associations. And, and we and others have done this. I'll, I'll give a particular shout out to the work done at the Broad on identifying a, t a new type 2 diabetes allele in a Mexican cohort that you know, may explain part of the health disparity in, in Mexican versus non-populations. Uh, uh, so there's tons of work to be done if we can really kind of organize and make this happen. So we're part of a, a project called PAGE, which has developed such a reagent, and these are the folks that were involved. You'll hear from Emer Kenny later on. And we've really sort of worked very, very hard to design a multi- and trans-ethnic array that can be deployed quite cheaply. The consortium price from Illumina is around $55 a sample, and we've used this to undertake the largest study to date on U.S. minority populations. 50,000 people have now been genotyped on this array. We're working with Illumina and hopefully our partners at SAP to integrate everybody who gets run in this array, which is currently on the order of about half a million people. Illumina has then thinned this out to create a global screening array that's now being genotyped in millions of people. So we could really create this resource that would allow this sort of reference data to percolate. And I'll give you, you know, just a, a view of what this looks like. A large part of, of this array is designed for mapping. Okay, it was fundamentally designed to do trans and multi-ethnic mapping, but we purposely put on there 30,000 variants that we knew or thought to be potentially clinically relevant as part of our work on ClinGen. And that's really what, what I want to focus on. Of this work, um, about half of the uh, variants that we put on the array are known pathogenic mutations as described by ClinGen and ClinVar. Uh, and that's great because it'll give us sort of the public health data that we want on those variants. The other are actually, in some sense, more important. They're variants of unknown significant. They're variants in which there are conflicting reports across uh, laboratories uh, as to the adjudication of pathogenicity. And there are benign variants. And we purposely put benign variants on there so that we could understand the global distribution of these to test against as we build pathogenicity um, uh, metrics and, and uh, sort of artificial intelligence measures of pathogenicity that, that we're sort of tasked to build. And, and I'll give you, uh, uh, you know, a, a bit more of a deep dive. You can't read the x-axis, but these are all of the genes uh, that the American College of Medical Geneticists have put on their incidental findings list. So if you run a clinical diagnostics lab and you have a panel and you find a variant in one of these genes, you're actually duty-bound to return that to the um, treating physician. And in our array, we've actually included hundreds of known BRCA1 and 2 variants precisely to understand their global frequency because they're unknown. We don't know if they're relevant or not in many different populations, and we believe this information will be quite important as we want to translate this into the clinic. Um, part of the other reason we wanted to do this is that the ACMG guidelines for determining pathogenicity explicitly use population allele frequency as one of the most important metrics that we can use, right? So knowing that a mutation is at very low frequencies and predicted computationally be pathogenic is actually an important determinant of whether or not this could be related with a rare disease given the incidence of the disease and the frequency of the variant. If we don't know the frequency of the variant, then we can't adjudicate adjudicate properly. So um, we've in particular focused in, uh, as part of this project, as, as I said, in populations of, of um, uh, throughout the Americas. So we've genotyped all throughout the Caribbean uh, and, and also U.S. minority populations. Seventy-five percent of participants in, in the study from the U.S. Were, of, uh, um, were underrepresented minorities. We've also genotyped the HGDP panel that comes from Stanford. It's 52 populations on a global scale. And I just want to give you a peek of what this looks like. We've literally just gotten this data off the press. This is one of the few times, uh, one of the first times we've talked about this publicly. So uh, the first thing we did, of course, is compare the data from PAGE to the data from EXACT. EXACT is the exome sequencing resource from the Broad, which is sort of the gold standard for allele frequencies. And you can see here in this sort of confetti diagram of pathogenic and, and variants of unknown significant that we are largely well aligned in terms of estimated frequencies. And of course, that's true for common variants because pay, um, PAGE is mostly minority populations, EXACT is mostly Caucasian populations. 
populations. But there's some fascinating differences, including variants on the x-axis that pay, uh, w w where exact uh, estimates them to be extraordinarily rare, but in fact, we see that they reach appreciable frequencies in our populations. That's very important as we try to determine whether these are really pathogenic or not, right? This is really kind of the gold standard that needs to be brought to bear in the adjudication of variants. And, uh, and I'll give you two additional examples of what we hope to, to do with this. This is now data on one of the most clinically relevant variants out there, CYP2C19, uh, as part of the Stanford work and PharmGK uh, from Russ Altman and, and Terry Klein uh, and the CPIC guidelines, we know this to be an incredibly important uh, variant in the, in the metabolism of clopidogrel. And now we've got actual uh, allele frequency data where you can see, even though it's you know, at modest frequencies in Europe and Africa, it actually is quite relevant and important in Southeast Asia and in Melanesia and other parts of the world where if you're you know, trying to make a decision, you need to understand the, the genotype of your patients. Another example is the very you know, most famous probably black box warning out there, CYP2D6, which is the variant that is involved in coding metabolism. You know, most community hospitals are not pulling codeine, even though it's a great drug for 90% of the population, because they're worried about ultra-rapid metabolizers that could um, take codeine, turn it into morphine so quickly that the kids OD, right? Now we've got great baseline data, again, from 50,000 people that could be integrated in our clinical decision support. The last shout out I want to give are to our partners at SAP. For the last four or five years, it's been a tremendous pleasure to work with them in building out an integrated solution that brings EHR data, wearables data, and genomics data. We've piloted this with Ewan's clinic. Uh, I've, I've picked on a, a particular, you know, um, a Dutch white guy here. Uh, he's, he's not really that guy, but you know, just gives you a sense of what this looks like. We've got uh, an, a, a console now that brings together the, the patient's uh, genetic information with recommendations, and, and you can click through here and, and see also their wearables data and, and really begin to build that world that, that uh, we all want to see. So with that, I'd like to sort of leave you with some thoughts. What we've learned so far in diversifying these kinds of study is that common variants are rare and rare variants are common and largely population specific. And so it's quite important to, to broaden representation. The NIH is really moving the needle in, in building these resources and we hope to really build this into the precision medicine initiative. Um, the challenges ahead are how do we really do this boots on the ground? How do we improve interpretation? How do we really roll this out into clinical decisions? decision support. And the last point is that diversity doesn't just mean ethnic diversity, right? We need to also think about socioeconomic factors, rural factors, all the things that really are going to impact care boots on the ground. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. I look forward to talking to you on the panel. Thank you.